Order, order. This is the Transport Select Committee's second evidence session on the coronavirus and the implications on aviation. Could I ask our sole witness to introduce himself, please? Uh, good morning. I'm Willie Walsh, Chief Executive Officer of the International Airlines Group. Mr. Walsh, good morning to you. Thank you for being with us. This session um, is focused primarily on um, British Airways, IAG's evidence from you. Uh, we'll be talking to you about the financial support available from governments, uh, about the challenges on your own staff's terms and conditions, on passenger refunds, and on um, the health and protection for passengers and staff. Uh, but can I start, first of all, by just asking you to summarise the very severe challenges on your company, British Airways, and also on the aviation industry, and also ask you if the news of a 14-day quarantine is going to make things even harder for you? Well, by any measure, this is the most severe downturn that the airline industry has witnessed. Uh, certainly in the 41 years that I've been in the industry, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, some people ask if it is similar or in any way related to the challenges we faced in 2001. And to put it into context, in October 2001, global passenger demand traffic fell by 19%. And in November 2001, it was down by 16%. So you know, a very severe downturn. Uh, in the global financial crisis of 2008, traffic fell by about uh, 6% in September. And then in December of 08, it was down by about 8%. So again, a very significant downturn. But to put this one into context, in March, globally traffic was down over 50%. So we, we have never seen anything like this. This is the most significant crisis that the industry has faced. And it's a global challenge. Uh, markets right across the world are experiencing similar downturns. Uh, for uh, IAG, uh, our traffic in March was down by over 50%. Our capacity in March was down by over 33%. Uh, and to explain the, the sudden nature of the downturn, if you look at our financial performance, and we released figures last week uh, to the market, but we made the point that in January and February, our performance was in line with 2019 and in line with our plans. And yet, uh, for the first quarter of 2020, we reported an operating loss of 535 million euros. All of that uh, downturn taking place in March of this year. So a very severe, uh, very significant crisis. And quite honestly, uh, the likelihood of it improving in the short term is zero. The announcements yesterday of a 14-day period uh, of uh, coming into the, the UK is, um, well, it's definitely going to make it worse. There's uh, nothing positive in anything that I heard the Prime Minister say yesterday. So we had been planning to resume on a pretty significant basis of flying in July. Uh, I think we'll have to review that based on what the Prime Minister said yesterday. Yes, yeah, I think, believe Mr. Walsh, he talks about returning to 50% capacity. Um, in July. Um, do you have an indication of what type of return you would commit to if there is a 14-day quarantine in place? No, not at this stage. I think it's too early given that the announcement was only made yesterday. And despite the fact that there had been some rumours uh, about this quarantine period, I don't think anybody believed that the UK government would actually implement it if they were serious about getting the economy moving again. So we will have to review the situation. It wouldn't really impact us today because, quite honestly, there are very few people flying into or out of the UK at this time. And the same would apply, I think, in, uh, well, throughout the rest of this month and in June. Uh, but given that we had been expecting governments around the world to start easing restrictions, uh, the introduction of a 14 day quarantine period for air travel, which is, is a surprise. Uh, because uh, it appears that uh, the government is not going to apply a quarantine period for uh, 
people who come into the UK by other means of transport. Uh, I don't understand that, but maybe the Prime Minister will be able to clarify the science behind that. It seems strange to me. Uh, but we will have to uh, review the impact of that and make an assessment in terms of the capacity that we're likely to operate if a quarantine period applies. Uh, at this stage, I would imagine that our capacity into and out of the UK would be pretty minimal in that event. Um, we're, we're having a bit of difficulties with uh, your sound, but we can still hear you. We'll try and work on it from our end. Before I hand over to Greg Smith, can I just ask you, overnight it would appear that the um, British and uh, French position uh, has changed so that there won't be a quarantine for people coming in from France. What difference would you say there is with France versus, say, Germany? Well, that's a bit I don't understand. So we would wait on clarity because when I listened to the Prime Minister yesterday, he said travel by air. He didn't make any reference to train, boat. Uh, so uh, I don't know if uh, there is a suggestion that if you fly from France to the UK, you will have to go into quarantine, but you take the Eurostar, you won't. So uh, Kwasi, you probably know more than I do at this stage. So we'll have to uh, await and uh, see the, the finer details of what the Prime Minister intends to do. Okay, thank you. Um, let me hand over to my colleague, Greg Smith. Uh, thank you and good morning. Um, I, I appreciate how difficult it is with the 14 day quarantine to make projections in the short term of when you might be able to get passenger numbers up. Something that we explored in our last session with other witnesses was the proportion of world freight uh, that actually goes in the belly hold of passenger aircraft. Do you have any assessment or plan of when you might be able to get aircraft moving to, if you can't carry passengers in the short term, carry that freight? Well, we're doing that at the moment. In April, we operated 422 dedicated freight flights using our passenger aircraft. Uh, British Airways does not have any freighter aircraft. So all of the cargo that we transport is transported in the what we call the belly hold of passenger aircraft. And given the significant reduction in uh, passenger capacity, uh, there is demand for air freight. It's significantly lower than it was last year, but the supply has been choked off. Uh, so in order to provide that critical link, we have been flying our passenger aircraft carrying cargo only. Uh, so that was 422 flights in uh, April. We expect it to be more than that in May and again in June. But we will continue to provide critical cargo links. In addition to that, we, we do have uh, partnership arrangements with a couple of key players where we're using their dedicated freighter aircraft, so especially Qatar Airways. Uh, and we're transporting a lot of freight on their cargo aircraft in an arrangement, a commercial relationship that we have with them. So we will continue where possible to fly uh, critical supplies into and out of the UK. So as the economy does step up, manufacturing's coming back online, people are being asked to go back to work where they absolutely can't work from home, which by definition is manufacturing, is construction, things like that. You do have a plan to step up the use of passenger aircraft to, to carry freight where you can't carry passengers. If the demand exists, we certainly will. The sort of freight we're carrying at the moment, uh, we've transported, uh, I think, about 2,000 tons of PPE. Uh, we're transporting uh, thousands of tons of food uh, and medical supplies. Um, surprisingly, we're also transporting things like gold, diamonds, and uh, money. So uh, it, it's an unusual sort of... Uh, collection of items that we're transporting, the most critical one being the uh, protective, personal protective equipment that we're flying in from various parts of the world uh, into the UK to support the NHS. And that's with uh, the arrangements with the NHS and uh, the UK government and also for uh, some uh, private suppliers as well. Okay, that, that's very helpful, thank you. Can we move on uh, to post-COVID-19 where normality, if we can call it that, uh, does resume whenever that may be. What is short, medium and long-term vision for British Airways specifically as a company? Our estimate at this stage is that uh, it'll probably be 2023 or 2024 before we get 
back to the levels of demand that we witnessed in 2019. So we're likely to lose three or four years of uh, growth. Uh, it's going to be a slow recovery based on all of the analysis that uh, we have done. And I think that's generally shared by other uh, analysts in the UK uh, industry and by analysts of the global industry. So um, during that period, we will be gradually building up our activity and we would expect that it won't be before 2023 that we get back to the levels of flying that we saw last year in 2019. Uh, that clearly depends uh, on not just a post-COVID environment, but also a post-global recession, which we're all forecasting. Without any doubt, the global economies have uh, effectively come to a halt. So we have the double impact of the restrictions as a result of COVID-19 and then the downturn associated with the uh, economic recession. How long that recession is likely to last is difficult to predict at this stage. Uh, but whatever way we look at this, our most optimistic scenario is that it will be about 2023 before we get back to 2019. There are some people predicting that it won't be until 2026. Uh, so, you know, this will be something that we continue to assess as we uh, monitor the global demand for both passenger and cargo flying. Sure, I mean, nobody can doubt that, that demand is, is going to be down and demand will probably be down for some time. But in terms of where British Airways plans to maintain itself as, as one of probably the most identifiable British companies in the world, and indeed where British Airways sits within the wider IAG group, um, where where is your planning in terms of seeing where BA as a brand and BA within the IAG group will sit over the, the short, medium uh, and long term? And if I may, within that, given that uh, challenge around demand that, that, that you mentioned, where does the purchase of Air Europa sit into those plans? Okay, well, let me deal with Air Europa first. The acquisition of Air Europa, if it does proceed, will be an Iberia acquisition. So uh, the, in the same way as when uh, we acquired BMI, that was acquired through British Airways. So the Air Europa acquisition, if we proceed with it, will be acquired by uh, Iberia. It will have nothing whatsoever to do with British Airways. British Airways will not be involved in it. Uh, British Airways will not have any role in the acquisition, either through funding or, or through the management of it, that will all be done at a Nigeria level. So where does EA sit? Well, maybe you need to uh, just have a look at IAG and understand what it is. IAG is a single economic entity with multiple operating entities. Uh, each of the major airlines that sit within the group operates its own profit and loss. Uh, it has its own balance sheet. Uh, it uh, fundamentally makes most of the uh, decisions uh, at a management and board level in the operating company. The activity is coordinated at an IAG level and consolidated where it makes sense to do so. Uh, so British Airways will continue to play the role that it has played since the beginning uh, of the, uh, or since the creation of IAG. Uh, it is one of the four main carriers uh, within the group and it will continue to be one of the main carriers within the group. When we analyze the uh, impact of this, we have tasked each of the airlines to assess the impact independently. They've all looked at how they see their markets, their segments responding, uh, and we've built it up then from the inputs made by individual airlines and also from a top-down approach that we've done at IAG. Uh, they're remarkably similar. Uh, so there's very little difference in opinion uh, between the management teams at each of the airlines as to how this will play out from a global aviation scene. Uh, consider uh, in some detail going forward is whether um, business travel responds at the same rate of leisure travel, given that uh, BA has a much greater exposure to uh, business travel than other airlines in the group. That, that's helpful, thank you. And, and mindful of time, if I may just ask uh, one last question within that. It, it's my understanding from the numbers that British Airways as an entity is 
I appreciate the point you make about being one of the four main carriers within IAG, but British Airways as an entity uh, accounted for actually most of the profit of the whole, or a, a lion's share of the profit of the whole group uh, last year, and, and indeed has a history of that. So can you give a commitment that British Airways will continue to be developed as, if you like, the leading carrier and as indeed, you know, the economics speak for themselves, the most profitable entity that, that the group has? Well, it depends on how you measure profit. Uh, we look at a number of metrics. Uh, one of the principal metrics we look at is the return on invested capital, the amount of capital that each of the airlines use. Uh, British Airways has the lion's share of the capital invested, so therefore you would expect it to make the lion's share of the profit. Uh, unfortunately, it's also the case that British Airways has probably got the highest fixed cost base of all of the airlines in the group. And therefore, when we look at the um, impact, the financial impact of this downturn, uh, the swing from profit to loss is going to be much greater at British Airways, and that certainly was the case in the first quarter than it was in the other airlines. So the risk for BA in the short term is that, yes, while it is profitable, it does make the lion's share of the, the profits uh, you know, typically, it's got over 60% of the invested capital would make about 60% plus of the profitability. Uh, but in the downturn, uh, unless British Airways adjusts its cost base more significantly than the others, it's going to make significantly greater losses than the other airlines. And that's exactly what we saw in first quarter of this year. Thank you. Um, we're going to turn now, Mr. Walsh, to financial support uh, that you may have sought or may indeed seek from governments. Uh, I'll ask Gavin Newlands to kick us off, please. Uh, thank you much, Chair, and uh, good morning, Mr. Walsh. And a, a con continuation, if you like, from uh, previous questions to, to set this section up, can I ask, um, given what you've said, and I think we know over the last six years, BA have generated some, over £8 billion pounds of profit for the IAG group. How much cash or liquidity um, does the IAG group or, or British Airways for that matter have on hand at the moment? So um, what we do is uh, when we report our liquidity, we report it on an aggregate basis. So last uh, Thursday, uh, we released figures for our liquidity at the end of April. And at that point, we had uh, 6.4 billion euros of cash and cash equivalents, and then we had uh, total liquidity of uh, 10 billion, uh, so 3.6 billion of facilities. We have not drawn any of those facilities. Those facilities, in fact, represent debt. Uh, so um, if we were to draw on them, we're just taking on additional debt. Uh, they're in a, a number of forms. Uh, some of those are short term. Uh, we have a 12 month revolving credit facility uh, with British Airways secured a number of their aircraft. Uh, so it's a, an asset-backed, uh, uh, secured uh, facility. Uh, we have a number of uh, facilities at an IAG level and a number of facilities at the operating company. So we aggregate the, the liquidity. We don't uh, disclose the individual uh, cash held by the individual airlines. Clearly, it's something we have uh, within the business. Uh, uh, we normally disclose it at a year-end basis, but not as we go through here. Uh, thanks. It's, it's interesting you aggregate all of the liquidity, but you separated out the investment into Air Europa as part as an Iberia investment. Um, that's a, an interesting distinction. But to visualise this kind of financial strength, um, perhaps you could give us an idea. There's another European airline, say, Wizz Air, who are a, a financially strong airline, albeit smaller, who've also received £300 million of UK government uh, funds or loans. Um, it's estimated that they could survive for 20 months without, survive, uh, without flying a single plane. What would be the, the equivalent period for IAGB without flying a plane? Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to actually give a figure that's accurate because it depends on the measures that will be taken. Uh, but uh, you know, what, what we're saying is that uh, if you looked at the uh, cash within the business, uh, we have uh, reduced our cash operating costs, excluding some items, to about uh, 200 million euros per week, uh, so 800 million euros uh, per month. So you know, that, that's a, a um, figure which we estimated for April and May. Uh, it will change as you go through the year. 
and that includes most of the cash uh, outflows of the business. Uh, it doesn't include all of them, for example, excluded from that are the uh, pension uh, deficit repayments that uh, British Airways makes, that's 150 million. Uh, pounds per annum. So there are some issues excluded from that debt repayment excluded, but they're pretty minor. And we've also excluded some revenue. So we excluded the revenue that we generated from our cargo. And when I said we aggregate the cash, that's on a reported basis. The cash is actually held by the individual operating companies. So British Airways holds the cash that BA has, Iberia holds the cash that it has. So the cash is actually held at the operating company level. But for reporting purposes, we aggregate the cash and then report it as a single figure. And is it this obviously very strong and market leading cash position the um, reserves that you have that has led to you being in the past certainly very highly critical of state intervention uh, in the industry? And given that IAG Spanish operations, obviously Iberia and Whaling have applied for and received over a billion euros from the Spanish government. And British Airways have taken £300 million from the UK's corporate uh, coronavirus um, scheme. To what extent have your previous deeply held principles changed as a result of the coronavirus situation? No, they've, they've not changed at all. Uh, and uh, I think it's, a, it's an excellent question to ask. Uh, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to clarify. Because I have been quite open in saying that where general facilities are made available, and IAG will avail of those facilities if they make sense to the business. And what I have objected to in the past is uh, state bailout. And the, the bailout I would define as where you give cash to a company that has failed or is failing. That's not the case in this situation. I think there are many fine companies who, through no fault of their own, are suffering significant financial and liquidity uh, crises as a result of uh, the coronavirus and for the airline industry uh, as a result of the, the virus, but more importantly, as a result of the restrictions that governments have imposed on travel. So I, I've been very open in saying that if there are general facilities that are available, we will, where possible, avail of those facilities if it makes sense to us. So in the case of Iberia and Willing, uh, the uh, Spanish government uh, has provided a guarantee to the Spanish banks up to 70% of uh, the loans that they make under what's called the, the eco process. Uh, so this is a commercial loan that uh, Iberia has taken from a consortium of Spanish banks. Welling has taken a, a loan from the, the same consortium. Uh, that is debt that Iberia and Welling have to repay. Should we not repay it, in other words, if there's a, de a default on the part of uh, Iberia or on the part of Welling, then the Spanish government will provide a guarantee of up to 70% of the debt to the Spanish banks. Uh, so those facilities are not available in the UK, certainly not at this stage, nor are they available in Ireland. So the facilities that we have availed of uh, across the group are income support facilities, uh, which is the case in Ireland, uh, the UK and in Spain. And then the specific uh, coronavirus uh, um, funding under the Bank of England where we've issued 300 million of commercial paper which the Bank of England has bought. And to avail of that facility you have to have a, a credit rating, um, an investment grade credit rating on the 1st of March which we did have. So that's available to any company, it's not specific to airlines, it's available to any company in the UK that had investment grade uh, credit rating on the 1st of March. Uh, so we, we did apply for that. Uh, we sold uh, or issued 200 million of uh, commercial paper, which the Bank of England wired. It, thanks so much. Could you confirm that IAG will never approach the UK Treasury for a bespoke package as um, the Treasury has offered instead of um, an a industry-wide scheme? Um, or indeed, if the UK changed and, after, and changed to a kind of Spanish model, would, would that change your mind and perhaps British Airways would come forward to receive finance that way? And lastly, just the third part of this question, um, who would make those decisions? Would it be yourself or would it be Mr. Cruz? And how much input would he have on it? So um, we're very conscious of what the Chancellor said in the letter that he issued to the industry, I think it was on the 24th of March, where he made clear that uh, the Chancellor... Uh, acting on behalf of the government and the taxpayer would expect all companies, particularly in this case, it was directed to airlines, 
to avail of all other opportunities before they approached the Exchequer uh, for any assistance. So it was clear from what he said was that he expected us to do everything we could in our own part, uh, which included accessing the commercial market, uh, accessing uh, funds from shareholders, uh, and having exhausted all of those facilities, if Ireland still required funding, and only at that stage should they approach the uh, exchequer for a bespoke. We're not in that position. Um, you know, we will do what's right for the business. The decision ultimately, uh, because British Airways um, would require to do that themselves, it will be done at the British Airways level, uh, with the approval of the BA board. Uh, and clearly we would, uh, at IG, have an input into that. But the commercial paper that was issued to Bank of England was issued by British Airways, not by IAG. In the same way as the loans taken on in Spain are loans taken on by Iberia and by Vueling, not by IAG. But IAG separately can access financing. Uh, we would do so, and that's uh, something that we might look at. Uh, but in the main, uh, any funds that are raised are uh, raised at the operating company level, supported by their own balance sheet. Okay, thanks. You've explained in part the, the twin track um, approach between the Spanish operation and the UK operation, but uh, I think certainly for our British Airways employees, ourselves as MPs and the general public, um, see that by far the majority of the IAG profit is generated by British Airways. This has been addressed thus far, uh, but, but you've decided to slash 12,000 jobs in this country uh, whilst essentially saving Spanish jobs. Um, does that not kind of strike you as a little unfair? Well, that's not correct. Uh, so that's not the case. Uh, so allow me to explain uh, for you uh, what we have done at British Airways, as required to do under UK law, is to advise our elected representatives of the need for restructuring. And as you know, under the Trade Union and Labour Relations Act of 1992, uh, we're required to do that at uh, the earliest stage possible. Uh, we're required to advise the Secretary of State uh, if there are likely to be any redundancies. And then we're required under law to engage in consultation to give the elected representatives an opportunity to influence uh, the decisions that will be taken, uh, to mitigate uh, any redundancies that may be required, uh, to reduce, if possible, any redundancies that may be required. So the British Airways restructuring that you read about in the paper uh, is on the back of consultation that we are required to do, and that we will do, and that we've entered into in good faith to give the elected representatives an opportunity to, to influence that. The labour legislation in Ireland and in Spain, uh, the two other major countries in which we are right, it's different. Uh, we're required to do it in, in a different way, and we are embarking on restructuring and have made that clear that this is group-wide restructuring. It's not specific to British Airways. It's group-wide restructuring in the face of the greatest crisis that the airline industry and the airlines within IAG have ever faced. So uh, it's not as you portray. Uh, we are not picking on British Airways. Uh, we're not doing anything that we don't believe is absolutely necessary to secure the survival of uh, British Airways, and we're doing exactly the same uh, with the other airlines in the group, uh, complying with the law as uh, it exists in the countries in which we operate. Well, Mr. Walsh, would you, certainly I um, agree with the maxim that a business's best asset is its people. You've indicated that you, that, or Iberia on behalf of IAG, will continue to purchase the airline Air Europa. As far as I understand it, you still will have an order for 277 uh, MAX um, aircraft. Um, and no. there's also, you can come back on me in a, in a second then, Mr. Walsh, on that, but um, there's rumours that you plan to use your relative strength to see off rivals uh, such as, as Virgin at Heathrow and potentially invest in other airlines such as, as Austrian Airlines. Can you perhaps um, tell us if any of that um, is true because it seems to us your the business is prioritising investment uh, in the business um, uh, or equipment rather than its people. 
Well, I'm glad you've asked me the question and not uh, believed what you read in the newspapers. So uh, allow me to address those issues. I've made clear that if we proceed with the acquisition of Air Europa, uh, it will be an acquisition done at the Iberia level. Uh, we have not ordered 200 MAX aircraft from Boeing. Uh, we have signed a letter of intent with Boeing. Uh, that is not a firm order. Uh, we still have time uh, to address what we turn that into a committed order. We are not interested in acquiring Austrian or any other airline that you may have read about. So that's not the case. We are solely focused at this stage on taking the measures that are necessary to ensure that we can, uh, in the in the short term, shore up the liquidity that we have. And, and the team, uh, both uh, at IG and in the operating companies, have been working extremely hard to secure cash where it's available and to secure additional liquidity so that we can survive a period when we're not actually flying. We still have significant costs. So uh, all of those issues are pure speculation on the part of ill-informed or uninformed people. And let me specifically address the suggestion that I'm trying to use my relative strength to drive others out of business. I, I, that's absolute rubbish. And I would challenge anybody to come up with uh, anything that I have said in relation to that rather than journalists commentating on what they think I may be doing. Uh, so, you know, I've been very clear that uh, we're focused on doing what's right for ourselves. Uh, I'm sure every other airline is equally focused on doing what's right for them. Uh, I've not made any public comment in relation to uh, the difficulties that uh, one of our competitors at Heathrow Virgin uh, is facing. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. Uh, on uh, Thursday, when I was asked about this, uh, I said that I didn't see Virgin as being a failing or failed airline. I do see it as a badly managed and badly run airline, given that it hasn't been profitable. Uh, but I don't see it as a failed or failing airline. And if they can avail of support, I wish them well. Uh, so uh, talks of using relative strength to drive competitors out of business is total nonsense. And I, I think you've got to realize you know, the airline industry is not functioning at the moment. We're not flying. Uh, our relative strength is the cash that we have, which we're burning through until we can get to a position whereby we start flying again and start generating cash to shore up our liquidity. Uh, if we have to avail of the facilities that we've negotiated, it means we're taking on additional debt, which will make the future even more difficult for all of the airlines in the group, given that that debt will have to be repaid. So I wish every airline well in the current environment. Uh, I hope to see uh, many of them come through this. I firmly believe that not all of them will, because many, many of them were poorly run and quite honestly weren't viable in good times. I can't see how they would be viable in uh, the change in which we're operating. Okay, thank you much, uh, Mr. Walsh. And, and back to you, Chair. I think I've used up more uh, than my share. Uh, thanks, Gavin. We are going to touch separately on uh, matters pertaining to staff, Mr. Walsh, because we've received hundreds of emails from your staff. But let's stay on financial support. And I think I'm going to go to Sam Tarry next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Mr. Walsh. Um, just to dig a little bit deeper into some of the uh, figures you're talking about, um, on some estimations over the last five years, we talk about your free cash flow. It's meant that you've been able to, as IAG, the group, be able to pay dividends and share buybacks that are about 171% of free cash flow. That means that IAG is probably used as debt to increase the return to shareholders essentially. And within that, about 66% of that FCF to buy back its own share in Delta. Now, with your comment about the cost, the actual costs at the moment um, of running uh, or not running in, in this case, uh, the airline, I just wanted to focus on that for a second because it seems to me that there seems to be some discrepancy between the way that you're using your strategy in terms of the resources you've got and then the consequences of that. It would occur to me that with almost all aircraft grounded, 80% of your workforce furloughed are actually paid for by us, the taxpayers, fuel costs down to zero, navigation fees actually deferred, and maintenance and capex obviously being postponed. And your payments to suppliers will have been extended, and most of the cash collected from customers has not actually been reimbursed as we've investigated on previous committees. So, in fact, the cash burn to BA at the moment will have significantly decreased. And so, 
obviously the thousands of people who have been getting in touch with us who your staff members will be asking that very question. You are more than capable of not laying off 12,500 staff, given the good standing of BA. I'm um, not sure I heard a question there, but allow me just to address some of the issues. Um, we have been reimbursing our customers. Uh, I, I didn't listen to what was said before, and I don't recognize uh, any of the figures that I read in the press in relation to reimbursement. We, we've been very clear that uh, where we cancel uh, a flight, uh, the customer is entitled to a refund, and we will refund the customer. We have also made available to the customer the option of cancelling their flight in advance should they wish to uh, either rebook or cancel it. And in that case, we'll allow them to rebook or we will offer them a voucher. That's in a situation where we haven't yet cancelled the flight. So we have been refunding our customers and we will continue to refund our customers. I think it's important to point out that our systems were never designed to deal with volumes that we're dealing with at the moment. So we, we may take a little bit longer than we've traditionally done, and we apologize for that. And we thank our customers for their patience in this. But I can assure you that if our customer is entitled to a refund, the customer will get a refund. Uh, in, in relation to dividends and share buybacks, uh, the cash for the dividends have been funded by all of the airlines within the group. Uh, not all of that has come from British Airways. Uh, in fact, in, Proportion to the size, uh, more, more proportion has come from Aer Lingus and has come from British Airways. Uh, so Aer Lingus has probably been uh, one of the star acquisitions of IAG and the performance of that business and its ability to generate cash for the benefit of the business and for the benefit of our shareholders has been significant. But it is important to point out that most of the profits that we have earned and generated gets reinvested in the business. Uh, most of that being spent on new aircraft, not just to renew the fleet that we have, but also to expand the fleet we have. And that will continue to be the case going forward. I think, though, the point is that the financial strength of the company, that if it was in a weaker position, there would be a stronger argument that you were going to not be able to sustain the workforce going forward. Whereas, obviously, you know, with that strong position, with that ability, even in the last year to have, you know, multi-billion pounds amounts of money in uh, cash reserves, not just in BA, but across the IAG group. It makes it very, very difficult for the public and for MPs to understand why these decisions have been taken and not draw the conclusion that actually this is about a predetermined decision to restructure the company and to do so in a way which is potentially quite market advantageous uh, versus your rivals. And you say that obviously, you know, most of the money's been reinvested into the company. Obviously you yourself between 2011 and 2019 were paid over 33 million pounds in pension bonuses and payments. Now, I think that for cabin staff who've been in touch with us, who've perhaps worked for your company for 20 to 25 years, they're going to be really wondering how that was possible for you. But as soon as the going gets tough for them, they're thrown on the scrap heap. So just to uh, remind you again that what we're doing at the moment is engaged we're engaging in consultation as we're required to do under UK labour legislation with elected representatives on the restructuring of British Airways. That restructuring is solely driven by the fact that we are now in the deepest downturn that the aviation industry have, has ever seen. Our uh, capacity is going to be significantly lower in 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023 and beyond than we had planned to be that the amount of flying we're doing will be significantly lower than the flying that we're proposing to do. And as a result of that, we need to restructure our business. We will engage in good faith consultations with the elected representatives uh, to uh, see if there are measures that can be taken that would reduce the need for restructuring or mitigate the impact on the employees. And I hope that we would do that. And I would hope we will see ideas coming forward from the elected representatives in an effort to influence how the company goes about. Without question, this has been driven solely by the downturn. I, I don't think I need to hide the scale of it because it's obvious to everybody we're not flying our aircraft to transport passengers because 
that demand, one, does not exist, and two, if it did exist, we're not able to because of government restrictions. So the challenge we face is a huge challenge brought upon by the impact of this coronavirus, which will be exacerbated by the economic crisis that everybody will face as a result of the uh, recession that uh, countries will face coming out of this coronavirus uh, crisis. So it's not for any other reason to ensure that we can take the measures to ensure that we survive and that we're in a position to continue to secure employment for as many people as possible as we manage our way through this post, uh, through a post coronavirus environment. I think we'll probably move on to some questions around staffing now from a number of my colleagues exactly on that point. Well, actually, before we do that, Sam, I'm conscious that Ruth Cabri wanted to come in on financial support from government. So as long as it's related to that, let's finish that section off, then we'll move to the staff issues, please. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, Mr Walsh, you say you want to make decisions on the basis of what works for British Airways and presumably your shareholders, but there are wider agendas here. Uh, and in different countries, um, conditions of government support include things such as protecting staff conditions. I believe that uh, uh, IAG staff in Spain won't be suffering the same uh, fate as is happening to BA staff here. Um, others include taking a government stake um, and conditions on climate emissions. So what's your view of these positions uh, by governments on behalf of taxpayers uh, and aviation workers? Uh, a number of governments uh, across Europe have uh, taken a different view as to the uh, economic impact of aviation um, and the standing of those companies within their economies. Uh, the UK government to date has taken the view that uh, you know, aviation has been significantly impacted but must stand and deliver in the same way as everybody else on its own two feet. No special rules have been made available, no special procedures have been made available to the industry. And I can understand that. I think the Chancellor has an extremely difficult job to do in the current environment, and I wish him and the government well. And we certainly appreciate the support that we have received from the Chancellor. Uh, and actually, I think he deserves credit for the speed with which he has moved uh, to address some of these concerns. Um, the conditions that I've seen uh, associated in other countries uh, probably make sense in the countries in which they're operating. Uh, I think in France, the government has talked about uh, a requirement to um, link the uh, support to environmental goals. Uh, some of that, though, however, appears to be to motivate Air France to buy new Airbus aircraft. So you can see a, a circular French economy developing there. Um, I've not seen what specific arrangements have been made by uh, some other countries, uh, but uh, I suspect that they, they will vary. But in the UK, uh, as I said, we've availed of the uh, Bank of England facility and we've availed of the uh, job retention scheme uh, to support our uh, people. Uh, in uh, Spain, there were no uh, conditions other than financial conditions attached to the loans that we take from the uh, Spanish banks. Uh, so there were no um, environmental conditions or employee conditions uh, associated with those loans. There are financial covenants associated with them, but uh, no additional um, covenants or restrictions imposed as a result of those loans. Yeah, Mr. Walsh, I actually asked what your opinion was of them. Um, and, you know, would, would um, BA consider uh, taking funding from the government if there were conditions? Or, uh, or do you think there's an implication for the aviation industry internationally on the fact that different governments are taking different positions? Well, I think in the UK, we were probably one of the first countries where the industry aligned with the government goal of net zero by 2050. Uh, so we, we've already got there. So I, I think trying to provide an additional incentive at this stage when we've already aligned uh, the objectives of our industry with the objectives of the uh, government. I don't think we require any uh, additional incentive. Um, what I can say to you is if uh, the UK government makes uh, new facilities available to industry uh, or to aviation, we'll certainly look to see if uh, it makes sense. 
uh, and if it can uh, help us in any way possible. Uh, and as I've said, we'll, we'll avail of, of everything that we can. But it is important to point out, and I, I think this has been lost on some people, that what we're doing is taking on additional debt. We're loading the companies with additional debt. That debt has to be repaid. Mm -hmm. That debt will influence how we can proceed going forward. It may well significantly reduce our ability to invest in new aircraft. And we have already, uh, we announced this last uh, Thursday, uh, renegotiated the delivery of new aircraft from both Boeing and Airbus uh, to reduce the number of aircraft that we will take from them over the next uh, two years, well, including 2020, so 2020, 2021, and 2022, by 68 aircraft from the 143 aircraft that we had uh, scheduled to take delivery of. So, you know, we, we will assess any uh, facility that is made available. Uh, and uh, quite honestly, at this stage, as I said earlier, our focus has been on to secure the liquidity necessary to survive through a period when we're not generating any revenues as a result of the, uh, the difficulties that the industry faces. And what's your view of some governments, such as I understand the US government is considering um, taking a, a stake as a, a quid pro quo for government support? And how does yeah, that... I yeah, I think what they've done, um, and you know, we've seen this in uh, other countries in different uh, industries uh, over the years, including here in the UK with the banking industry. And, and I can understand that that's a, a way of governments potentially benefiting on the upside uh, if uh, the recovery is faster than people had uh, projected. Uh, the US has always been different, you know, different. The US has always been ready to support uh, the aviation industry. Um, some of that uh, is because of the dependency that the US uh, Army or military has on getting uh, lift capacity from the commercial airlines in times of, of war or in times of uh, you know, where they, the uh, US Army has to be transported. So they, they need to have a uh, commercial fleet that they can call on because they don't have a fleet to transfer, uh, transport their troops. Uh, that's the only country where I'm aware that that's uh, really availed of. Uh, so they've always been keen to ensure that the uh, commercial industry exists. What we've seen at the moment is that they provided grants or cash uh, to airlines to support employment. They've also uh, provided uh, loans. Uh, some of those loans are, are guaranteed or could potentially uh, be uh, taken in the form of equity going forward. I haven't seen the full details. Uh, but, you know, we'll see different countries construct uh, support measures in different ways and uh, you know the UK government uh, is going to do something like that. I'm sure it will be done not on an aviation specific basis but on a, a you know a, a basis of supporting all um, businesses in the economy because all businesses are suffering at one level or another. Thank you, Ruth. Um, we'll turn now, Mr. Walsh, to the issue of redundancies, which could impact 30% of VA staff and changes to terms and conditions, which could impact those who are fortunate enough to keep their jobs. Just to put it in context, I must have received almost a thousand emails over the last week from members of VA staff concerned about this, very worried that things are bad enough for them with this virus without this uncertainty added on top. You've mentioned that this, the changes to the terms and conditions are solely as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. On that basis, if you bounce back, say, by 50% profit next year, will you actually give the 50% additional back to the terms and conditions that are currently under consideration? So will your staff share in the proceeds of growth as well as uh, be impacted by the costs of coronavirus? The um, restructuring that I've talked about is subject to consultation with the elected representatives. I, I'm not going to prejudge uh, in any way those consultations. We enter into those consultations in good faith. Uh, we will listen to what it is the elected representatives have to say, and we won't provide a running commentary. I've been clear about that. This is a serious issue. Uh, I share the concern of everybody in Putin, British Airways and in the other airlines in the group. This is an incredibly worrying time for everybody in the aviation industry, as it is 
for most people in the economy. And, uh, you know, I, I, I share the concern being expressed by uh, politicians about the impact that this will have on the UK economy as well. Uh, but it's important for me to be clear that I'm not in any way going to prejudge the outcome of the consultation that British Airways will undertake with the elected representatives. It is their responsibility to engage in that consultation, and I expect them to do so in good faith. I expect them to listen to all of the suggestions being made by the elected representatives. And I expect that to be done as soon as possible so that we can take the right decision to ensure that British Airways survives through this crisis. You know, you should not underestimate anybody who believes that this is going to be easy is, is, is dreaming. This is the greatest crisis we have ever faced. The liquidity that we have is reducing because the cash that we have is reducing. We, we've probably exhausted every avenue that I can think of at this stage to show up our liquidity. The cash uh, has been reducing uh, significantly, um, and that will be the case as we go through May, June, and July. And given that it's unlikely uh, that we will be doing any significant level of flying until July, at best, um, following on from the Prime Minister's announcement yesterday, maybe that's going to be delayed now beyond uh, July. We have got to be clear that we will have sufficient cash to enable us to survive through that period. We're not, we're not taking in any revenue. Uh, no, Mr. Walsh, you know, and, I, I appreciate And, and, and this, appreciate is, this is, that, no, I, I don't, sorry, I, I, I don't think people do appreciate well, I, I don't do, think because people my, do appreciate the, you, the scale, the difficulty that we're facing. My point was not um, critical about you taking the, the measures you are. I was suggesting to you and I do believe you can drill into this level of principle, because if you can drill into the levels of expected job losses, then surely, as a point of principle, you can say to the staff, if your terms and conditions are being reduced by 50%, as a general point, we will enhance them by 50% if you bring our revenues back up by 50%. That's not part of the consultation, that's a general point, and surely you can answer that for us. Sorry, with, with respect, I am required by legislation to drill into the expected redundancies. British Airways is required well, this is about, this to, about give, to give this the is detail. About the and British Airways. No, no, sorry, it, it's, it's restructuring. It's, uh, you know, it, it involves the restructuring. Uh, British Airways is required to give that level of detail under the law to the elected representatives and is required to engage in good faith consultations with a view to reaching agreement, which is exactly what British Airways will do. So, you know, I'm not going to negotiate with you. It's not a point of principle, it's a point of law. We're doing what we're required to do under the legislation that exists in the UK. And so we, will comply with, we will comply with that legislation can, and do can, what we're required to do. Just to be clear, you're telling us that if you were to say, yes, we will, allow staff that remain to share in the proceeds of growth by whatever prorated amount our growth is, that would be breaching the consultation requirements you have to abide by law. Are you telling us that? No, I didn't tell you that. Well, in that case, you can answer my question, surely. No, no, what I told you was that we're engaged in good faith consultations and, and we're not going to do anything to prejudge those consultations and those consultations will be between British Airways and the elected representatives, not between you and me. Well, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Mr. Largham. I think we'll pursue this point because it just feels to us, uh, or certainly to me, that there's a bit of cherry picking going on in terms of the arguments you can use or can't use. But over to you, Mr. Largham. Thank you, Chair, and good morning. A lot of my, okay. constitu a lot of my constituents uh, work at British Airways, and a lot of them, particularly legacy staff on older contracts, are very concerned that a lot of this is about restructuring the company and their contractual terms and conditions in a way that you might have desired anyway. I want to give you an opportunity now to perhaps comment on that further and give a bit more reassurance to your legacy staff. I, I don't differentiate between the employees and my colleagues in British Airways. That term is not a term that I would use. I can give reassurance to everybody employed in British Airways that we are engaged in these consultations in good faith to ensure that we do what is right to provide British Airways with a path to survival through this crisis and in the environment that will exist beyond the crisis. 
Okay. Uh, and one of the proposals is about creating a single group of cabin crew rather than the current three. Uh, what's going to be the implication for the cabin crew staff that that single group would mean? Well, again, that will be the subject of the consultation between the elected representatives and the journals. I'm, I'm not going to give a view in relation to the outcome of that consultation. Uh, that consultation will be entered into. It is a, uh, an issue that I would hope that the elected representatives would come forward with uh, proposals and alternatives as they see uh, to enable us together uh, to do what's right to ensure that British Airways can survive and to ensure that British Airways is in a position to thrive when we get through this incredibly difficult environment. Okay. Um, BA's had quite a number of issues with industrial relations over the last few years. And obviously, right now, the unions are in quite a weak position, given that they're not really able to meaningfully threaten any strike action. Is that an extra reason for you acting now? You know, quite honestly, I'm amazed you asked that question. We're not flying. The reason we're doing this restructuring is because we need to survive the crisis that we're in. You know, this has nothing to do with industrial relations. This has to do with the survival of the company to ensure that we can be in a position to continue to exist when things start returning towards normal given that we're likely to get back to an abnormal, uh, a normal environment for a number of years. The sole objective of the actions that we are taking is to ensure that we have a business, we still have a company, we still have bridge ways flying at some point when we get through this. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. We will spend all of our time and all of our effort to ensure that we do that. And we expect to do that in consultation and in collaboration with the elected representatives of the people that work in the areas. Okay, I, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I want to give others the chance to get their questions in as well. But thanks for your answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. We'll stay on the same theme. I'll hand over to Graham Morris. You're on mute, Graham. Uh, thanks very much, Chair, and uh, good morning, Mr. Walsh. Uh, you, you, you told the Chairman a few moments ago there that you didn't want to give a running commentary and that you couldn't negotiate with the Committee. So I've got some specific questions about um, things that have happened that I hope you're able to comment on without, without any kind of prejudice to your position. Uh, my colleagues have already said the volume of emails they've received from cabin crew, from staff, from trade unions. You know, clearly this decision to make 12,000 workers redundant is, is having huge um, impacts. So I'd like to ask to begin with, why did you choose to start and indeed propose to complete the process of making employees redundant while they were on furlough and still covered by the government scheme? Well, it's, it's very clear, and thank you for asking the question, because uh, I've heard a number of people comment on this, that the job retention team makes clear that you can be made redundant while on the uh, job retention scheme or indeed after it. Uh, so we engage in this process because, again, under the law, we're required to do so in good time. Uh, as soon as uh, it's evident that uh, the requirement is there, and that's what we're doing. We're, we're seeking to comply with our obligations under the law. Mr. Walsh, can I, can I ask you, I want to come back to that about obligations under the law and, and your references to um, um, consulting with elected representatives, which I presume means the government, but uh, specifically on another point related to your last answer, because you've told some of my colleagues that these measures are being taken as a consequence of the unprecedented crisis caused by coronavirus, the collapse in passenger numbers and so on. But what I'd like to put to you, uh, and I'd like to know if it's correct or not, is that you previously issued section 118 notices, these are statutory notices of redundancy, to the entire workforce of 40,000 a year staff, just before the government furlough scheme was introduced, and then refused to jointly lobby government with Unite the Union only to later withdraw those Section 118 notices when the furlough scheme was introduced. Is that correct? 
Um, my understanding is that on the 17th of March, I may be wrong about the date, uh, British Airways did issue um, HR1 and Section 108 notices to the government and to the trade unions. To the entire uh, engage... workforce for all 40,000 uh, employees. I, I, uh, my, my, my understanding, uh, and I'm subject to be corrected, is that it didn't have a specific number uh, on, the, uh, on the, the forms. Uh, but that uh, then there was a uh, consultation there. In fact, there had been ongoing consultation and negotiation with the trade unions. Through that negotiation, it was agreed that the HR1 uh, Section 8 notices would be paused uh, when the agreement was reached with the trade unions on availing of the job retention scheme. That's my understanding of uh, what happened at the time. If that's not correct, Mr. Walsh, will, will, you, will you write to the committee? I mean, it's a memorable date, that isn't it, St. Patrick's Day. But, but you know, if, if that wasn't the case, I'd be very interested to know. But can, can I ask you as well, a, again, it's in relation to uh, following up on your, your earlier uh, responses uh, in relation to consulting with elected representatives and the legal requirements that are placed on, on BA. Uh, and in fact, your own reference to as part of that consultation with government to see if it is possible to mitigate against any potential redundancies. What, what, what I can't quite get my head around is, how is it possible to mitigate against making a third of the workforce redundant and your proposal to remove all of the remaining employees existing terms and conditions? My colleague earlier talked about the, you know, the consolidation of the three groups of our cabin crew. How can that be possible when they're we're working under the threat of instant dismissal if they don't accept those new contracts? How, how can you possibly mitigate? Well, I'm, I'm sure you will appreciate that uh, the purpose of the consultation is to address that. Uh, I'm not going to prejudge that consultation. I would expect that to be an issue that will be dealt with by the elected representatives and the representatives of the British Airways. I'm not going to be directly involved in that. Uh, but the, uh, the issue is the subject of consultation. We're, we're doing what we believe is necessary and we're doing what we believe is required under the law. And we want to engage constructively with the elected representatives. Uh, you know, we, we've got incredibly smart people working for us at British Airways. Many of them will have seen previous crises. Many of them will have experienced challenges in other industries. We want to draw on all of that knowledge and all of that expertise to assist us in navigating our way through this. What we've been focused on in the short term, as I've said before, is ensuring that we have sufficient cash to give us time to engage in these consultations, not to be rushed, not to uh, take measures without having had the opportunity to consult, and that's exactly what we're doing. But Mr. Walsh, in your previous answers, which were very specific, you did refer to the levels of cash and liquidity that British Airways and the parent group hold. Wouldn't a reasonable person assume that given the furlough scheme that is funded by the taxpayer is going to run until June, that you have ample opportunity there to consider the longer term implications for BA and for the sector after the furlough period is finished? Well, maybe it's a great question to put it into context. If, if we were to avail of the job retention scheme for the full number of people that were furloughed in April, which uh, from memory was 22,600 out of the total workforce, and to avail of that for three months, the, the amount of benefit we would get, and it's pretty significant, I don't want to underestimate it, and I do very much appreciate what the Chancellor has done, but that would be equivalent to probably less than 10 days of cash burn at British Airways. So, you know, that, that, that scheme gives us about 10 additional days. Uh, to, it doesn't give us months. So anybody who believes that we can sit back and wait for months because we're in receipt of the job retention scheme, I, I'm afraid they're, 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 they misunderstand the scale of the challenge that we face. It does buy us a little bit of time. But, but that's that's measured in days, not, not in weeks and certainly not in months. I want to come back a little bit later. So I know lots of colleagues are trying to get in on this section. So I'll hand back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. I'll hand straight back over to Greg Smith. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to um, touch on a particular segment of your 
uh, workforce uh, now, uh, some, some of whom are affected by this have been in contact directly with me. And that is uh, staff that have come from the armed forces, particularly the Royal Air Force, uh, to work for British Airways after service uh, in the military. Uh, there is a talk of a scheme being offered to particularly pilots that have um, come from the RAF to go back to the RAF for a period, uh, should there be a need to make uh, these staffing changes that have been talked about. Can you comment on what that scheme is, please? I have heard a suggestion of a scheme. I've not seen any specifics, and I'm not aware of any specifics exist. But if it did exist, we'd be delighted uh, both to facilitate the RAF uh, and to facilitate any of our pilots who, who could avail of that. Uh, I think, quite honestly, if it is available, it would be excellent. But I, I have not seen any specific details of, of a scheme as yet. I have heard suggestion that it is being looked at and talked about. Uh, so hopefully we will see something. Okay, I think some of the unions have started, um, or they've put, there's been suggestion in a letter I've seen this morning, which I'm happy to forward on to you uh, from Valpa, that uh, they're actually starting to negotiate uh, on this point. Uh, if this is the case, I mean, I'm sure most staff, having done their service and actively chosen to leave the armed forces uh, to go to civilian life and to work for you, uh, everyone I've spoken to in that position is very happy working at BA, uh, I should say. Uh, if it is the case that at the end of your consultations, uh, you do have to reduce uh, staff numbers, can you give an assurance, uh, particularly as British Airways is a signatory to the Armed Forces Covenant, uh, for which I thank you, that uh, people that are in that position uh, will not be treated differently because there is, if you like, that easy get out for BA uh, to put people back into the RAF? Um, you know, we, we, we'll wait and see. As I say, um, and I have said repeatedly, I don't want to predict any of the consultation, but if you're asking for a personal opinion, um, you know, I, I have to say that, uh, you know, we have always worked very closely with the RAF. I've had the privilege and pleasure to have actually spent a little bit of time uh, visiting um, an RAF base in Lincolnshire and uh, going flying with them. And I admire hugely the professionalism of the Royal Air Force and the professionalism of the pilots that joined us from the RAF. And if there's anything we can do to work with them and facilitate one another, I'd be delighted to see it. Okay, I think the point I was getting at, if I may come back very briefly on that, is clearly if you do have to, after your consultations, reduce staff numbers and there is a scheme out there that will save jobs by allowing ex-servicemen to go back into the ser or ex-service women to go back into the RAF then that is a good thing but I think what what they want assurance around is that if that isn't uh, particularly the favoured route a will there be a guarantee that that will only be for a limited period there will be a job at BA to come back to once profitability uh, increases within the company and I think that's particularly important within the boundaries of having signed the armed forces covenant uh, and secondly will there be a guarantee that because most of them are actually behind staff that say joined fresh out of university or early in their careers because they did 5, 10, 15 years in the RAF first the last in first out principle won't apply in this case. Well, again, the, uh, the, the subject will be uh, for consultation, uh, but if I can assure you, uh, the our objective in everything we do would be that we don't discriminate against people. So uh, I, I can't talk about specifics, uh, but I appreciate what it is you're suggesting. Uh, I hope that a scheme will be made available. Uh, I think that would be a very positive development, not just for, for ourselves and the RAF, but for the individuals involved. And, and we'll wait and see if that is the case. But uh, if there's anything that I can do to encourage the RAF uh, to look at that, I certainly will do. Uh, as I said, I have great admiration for the professionalism of the organisation, and we do very closely with them. Thank you. Back, back to you, Chairman. Thank you. And Mr Walsh, if it's possible for you to come a little nearer your screen, I've been asked by broadcasters, that would be super. Thank you. Uh, and I'm also going to hand over to uh, Chris Loder, who you can't see, but uh, should be able to hear. Chris. 
And you've muted yourself, Chris, even though I can't. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, Mr. Walsh. Uh, I just have a, a couple of uh, questions for you, if I may. Uh, could you just uh, tell us how many of your staff have been advised that they are at risk of redundancy, please? Uh, so the process, as you know, is that uh, we um, advise the elected representatives, uh, and that's a combination of uh, the individual Section 188 letters which uh, go out to people. Uh, we have had general briefings with a number of staff. We've invited all of our staff to attend general briefings. To the best of my knowledge, the trade unions have encouraged people not to attend those briefings. Uh, I hope that won't be the case. Uh, so we, we don't advise any individuals uh, because it's, um, it is the subject of consultation. Uh, the numbers have been made clearer to the elected representatives of the areas involved. So just so I'm clear, you're saying that you have not written to any members of your staff concerning the redundancies or changes directly. It's all been done through, through trade unions. Is that correct? Uh, the, um, the letter, the Section 188... Uh, was made public uh, by, I don't, know, uh, I don't know who made it public, but it was made public. I've uh, read details of them in the uh, newspapers. Uh, so we have had, uh, as required to do, um, we have uh, sent the uh, details to the elected representatives and we have had briefing sessions with groups of people. Thank, uh, thank you, but my specific, of my, my specific question is, have you written to any staff specifically to advise them of the changes that are happening in British Airways um, uh, and specifically... I, I don't know. I'd, ha I'd, I'd have to check. I know that okay. uh, emails have been sent to people, uh, so, but it's on, a, it's on a collective basis. I don't believe we've written to any individual to, to uh, okay. specifically um, identify them as an individual. May I, um, may I ask you to um, maybe uh, write back to the committee with the answer to that question? Because from a telephone conference I had with a number of your employees over the weekend, it appears that some have been receiving letters and some haven't. So it would be really beneficial for us if you wouldn't mind just articulating that um, clearly. That would be much appreciated. Um, my, my next question is, um, how are you determining the staff who are at risk of redundancy here? Uh, that, that will be done in consultation with the elected representatives. Okay, so um, could you just be clear uh, whether or not, uh, are we talking about voluntary redundancy or enforced redundancies here? Uh, as I say, that, that will be the subject of uh, consultation with the elected representatives. And we would hope that working together, we can do what uh, everybody wants to do, which is to uh, steer a sensible course through this challenge. Uh, and to reduce the impact in any way that we can, but uh, critically to ensure that we have a viable business coming out of this. Mm. So in terms of, in terms of your uh, determination uh, of staff who are at risk, what you mean to say is that you are not differentiating in any way, shape or form between grade or length of service uh, of your employees, is that, is that correct? No I, no, I didn't say that. I, I said, and I need to be clear that, uh, you know, the issues will be the subject of consultation between the elected representatives and the uh, management in the areas involved. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm clear, because I think what, what, I re what we really need to understand here is, are you targeting redundancies to your staff based on their age or length of service in any way? I, I'm absolutely clear with you that we will comply with all legislation as it exists. Uh, the consultation will be good faith consultation with the elected representatives and all of these issues will be the subject of consultation with those representatives mm. as soon as possible. So the fact that your uh, more established members of staff who have received uh, correspondence from the union that suggests that they may be subject to redundancy and your members of staff who are a lot newer, who have a, uh, shall we say, a lot, a lot uh, less uh, period of service or length of service, uh, receiving direct letters saying the business is going through change but does not specifically state that you are, uh, that they are uh, subject to redundancy. Um, 
how how would you uh, how would you respond to that? Because to me, looking at that from an independent perspective, it does appear that the workforce has been segmented and that you have a, a targeted approach as to who may or may not be subject to redundancy. Well, you referred to correspondence from the trade union to people. I, I've not seen that. And then correspondence from the trade unions to the people has nothing to do with British Airways. So, I, so I ju just to be, if I, if I may, just to be clear, um, the correspondence I was referring to was actually, uh, I think, from your own head. Uh, I think it was from uh, the chief pilot. Uh, and uh, it was a forwarded letter from your own, uh, I think, head of industrial relations. I'm very happy to provide the specific letters afterwards if you'd like them. Um, but uh, those were the ones I was referring to. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, as, as I said to you, uh, I can assure you that we will engage in good faith consultation with the elected representatives on, on all of these issues. But, but you're not categorically ruling out that different groups of staff are being targeted potentially for redundancy? I, I am not saying anything other than it will be the subject of consultation between the elected representatives okay. and the management, as is required under UK legislation. So I'd just like to share with you that I think it's fair to say that approximately 90% of those who've been in touch with me have more than 20 years uh, length of service uh, with British Airways. Um, and I think it's also fair to say that the correspondence is clearly different. And uh, I think uh, if it would be helpful for me to share that with you, I'd be very happy to, if you'd like to get in touch, or in your office would like to get in touch. And my final question, if I may, um, is, is this. Uh, earlier on, you, uh, you said that, um, you know, this is necessary that you have to progress these redundancies because of the economic situation. Uh, and that was the primary driver for, for your, um, your redundancies that you've declared that 12,000 will be required. If that is the case, if, if this is purely because of the economic situation, could you just tell us why that requires the grievance and disciplinary procedure to be changed as part of the consultation? So it is the sole reason, not the primary uh, driver, that this consultation has taken place to ensure, as I've said, that we can have a business that survives through this crisis and can survive in a changed environment that will exist post this. The industry has changed. And anybody who believes that we're going back to the way things were in 2019 uh, misunderstands the, the scale of the challenge that is being faced uh, by the industry. So the consultation is on ensuring that uh, British Airways uh, can take all of the measures that are necessary to survive through this mm. and can survive beyond it uh, in an environment where I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful significantly for, weakened. I'm grateful for the point, but I, 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 with respect, I don't think you've really answered the question. You know, why does the grievance and disciplinary procedure require to be changed in this situation? Because it feels, and I think a lot of your staff feel, that actually this is this is commercial predatory on the part of British Airways, and I think they're they're very they're deeply deeply saddened to be in this situation. I recognise the economic pressures and the situation that we have to we have to deal with, or you have to deal with. But is it really necessary for things like the grievance and disciplinary procedure to be uh, to be changed as part of this? I'm deeply saddened that we have to do this. And I can assure you that what we are doing through this consultation will be to ensure that this business can survive and not just survive in the short term, but that this business is in shape to survive an environment that will be significantly different. And all of these issues will be subject to the consultation with elected representatives. We enter into those consultations in good faith. I expect, and, and uh, you know, I, I fully believe that the elected representatives will do so equally, and that together we will be able to shape British Airways to ensure that we can be in a position to survive going forward. With respect, you still haven't answered the question. Why do you want to change disciplinary uh, no, no, uh, and grievance policy? Because it has, there's nothing to I do with I, that. What, 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 uh, you know, sorry, it has, you know, you know with respect. You know, we need to ensure that all of the measures that will be in place in the future 
uh, at British Airways are relevant to a changed environment in which we'll be operating in. And all of these issues will be subject to the consultation with the elected representatives. And I would expect them to be able to demonstrate to us where they believe uh, some of the proposals that uh, the management team may have may not be necessary. And I fully expect the management team to take on board all of the suggestions through the consultation period that, are, that is made so that together we'll shape British Airways in the best way possible to ensure that not only do we get through this, because you know, there's no point in surviving this in the short term, only to collapse you know, once we get out of it in an environment that will be significantly different with a balance sheet that will be significantly different as a result of the changes that we've done in the short term. Mr. Walsh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Chairman, back to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, last uh, two members on the staff subject are Sam Tarry and Ruth Cabri. So, Sam, first of all, please. Yeah. Mr. Walsh, um, just thinking about the wider context and what you've said, and apparently you're doing this all in the best interests of staff uh, going forward, given the context that we're in, I just wanted to, to focus on outsourcing because in your letter to trade unions you say quite clearly you intend to outsource a number of jobs particularly at Heathrow for example in flight management central load control ticketing equipment and service functions North American Gateline worldwide baggage resolution center and that's you know several hundred jobs now I just wonder because I think a lot of taxpayers will be wondering this given you've obviously got our money to furlough staff how many of those jobs are you, are you actually assuming are going to be then offshored I think that's a that's a real problem because you do have a track record of offshoring jobs within the A and IAG. And if those jobs are going to India or Eastern Europe, people will be wondering why British taxpayers' money is being used to do that. And my question for you, Mr. Walsh, is if you're going to be moving jobs at a very difficult time out of the UK, so British citizens are losing their jobs and then you're giving them to citizens in different parts of the world, will you be prepared to hand back the British flag? Because actually perhaps the flag would be more relevant would be one from the Cayman Islands or perhaps, you know, Panama, because you certainly are not doing justice to the citizens of this country by those kind of manoeuvres. Uh, thank you for your comments, which uh, clearly I don't agree with. I think there was a question in there, though. Sam, do you want to just put a quick question? Oh, absolutely. On? You've been quite clear that you are looking to offshore and outsource jobs. So you have said throughout this whole conversation previously that everything is about protecting the jobs, you know, using the money you've got from the British government to ensure that as many people can retain in staff as possible. But that's contradicted by what you've already said in the letter to trade unions. No, I, well, I, I think you're uh, picking comments out of context. I, I didn't make those statements. What I've said is I'm pleased that we can avail of income support schemes for people in the group. And if those schemes are available that provide some short-term benefit to our employees, then we certainly will avail of that. And I'm very thankful to the measures taken by the Chancellor to ensure that that can be the case. Uh, the other issues you raise will be subject to the consultation between the elected representatives and British Airways. And all of those issues, I'm confident, will be addressed through the uh, consultation. But I can tell you, uh, as an Irishman, I was very proud to work for British Airways and very proud to work for a company that flew the British flag. I remain proud today and I will be proud for the rest of my life to have worked for an organisation that carries that flag with great pride and do such a great job representing Britain in every corner of the world. And Mr. I know Walsh, look, look with great issue of respect, that. Mr. Walsh, you know, we also have to look at your track record here. You have a track record of IT jobs that you've outsourced to Tata in India. And so, you know, those were jobs that have gone out of the UK to increase the profit margins of IAG. And that's not something that's made up. That's a fact. That's something that you have overseen. How do you answer that? Well, I, I'm, I'm proud of everything I have done. I'm proud to have uh, run a company in the way that I have done so. And, and I would point out to you that outsourcing is not a feature of British Airways since I joined uh, British Airways. outsourced activities for many years uh, before I joined the organisation. I have absolutely no doubt we'll continue to do so, as do a lot of other very big and very successful British companies. And I've absolutely no doubt that that will be the case going forward in the same way as there are a lot of companies who outsource activity to UK companies 
It is a feature of the global economy, and I've no doubt will continue to be a feature. But we will do what is right to ensure that we have a business that is as efficient as possible to enable us to compete effectively on a global scale, because that's what we compete with, and we will do so with pride. And so the staff that have spent 20 to 25 years and have built up you know, years of service are just going to be collateral damage in that, are they, Mr Walsh? Uh, that's not what I would say. What I would say is that I deeply regret, as I'm sure you do, the impact of this I certainly deeply regret that IAG on, are not uh, using uh, their uh, cash reserves to save British jobs. Absolutely, I regret that. I think it's a disgrace, quite frankly, Mr Walsh. Uh, I deeply regret that uh, the uh, coronavirus crisis has had such an impact on the aviation industry and as a result has led to the requirement to restructure our business. And I'm confident that that restructuring will be done in a meaningful way through consultation with the elected representatives in British Airways. And we will do everything that is necessary to ensure that we survive. The idea, uh, and I, I, you know, um, I don't, don't want to comment on how you would run a business, but the idea that you can exhaust all of your cash and hope that at the end of it, you still have a business, clearly is not something that any responsible business person would do. We have to take measures to ensure that the cash that we have can uh, enable us to survive through this crisis and where possible, take measures to augment that cash through additional debt. Uh, but at some point you will have exhausted, as the Chancellor has made clear, all available avenues. And we are doing everything we can to ensure that British Airways will survive through this crisis and to ensure that we have a business that will be able to compete and continue to compete on the global scale once we get through this. Can I bring in Ruth Cavery very briefly on this? Thank you, Chair. The proposals um, that BA has outlined to its workforce deeply undermine terms and conditions for all staff, including those in the mixed fleet who have already got very, very poor terms and conditions and very low pay. Um, however, in Spain, the, uh, um, I understand the Iberia and uh, Welling uh, offer, um, there are some redundancies announced, but in Spain, no one can be made redundant till at least six months after the end of the furlough period. And they are not being, those staff there are not being asked to reduce their terms and conditions. Is it right that we have uh, one, uh, one rule for BA staff here and another rule uh, for IAG staff in Spain? Um, it's not a rule. Uh, it is uh, what applies in the different countries. And I would point out that Iberia staff uh, only a short number of years ago went through a major restructuring of their business where their terms and conditions were adapted, uh, which included both their pay and the conditions of employment and also significant redundancies in the airline. Uh, the, uh, the terms of the income support scheme do vary from country to country. Uh, but we have made it clear uh, that we will take whatever measures are necessary in each of the organisations to ensure that they can survive. This is not about doing something uh, specific to British Airways. What we're doing with British Airways is to ensure that BA can survive. We will do what is right for Iberia to ensure that Iberia can survive. And quite honestly, they're probably facing as big, if not bigger, a challenge than British Airways. And I can assure you that the management team at Iberia will be doing everything they possibly can to right-size Iberia to ensure that it can survive through this and can continue to compete as they have done prior to this. Uh, can I just touch, Mr Walsh, on um, a couple of your airports, in, uh, specifically in terms of your operations from those airports? Firstly, Gatwick. Uh, BA accounts for 17% of all of Gatwick's operations. Uh, do you see a future for British Airways at Gatwick? Yes, I do. And is that, is that a sort of commitment to return operations to Gatwick on that basis? No, no, it's, it's to our future, yes. Uh, and I would hope that through consultation, these issues will be addressed. But if you're asking me, do I see a future? Yes, I do see a future for British Airways at Gatwick. I like Gatwick. I think Gatwick is a better airport and Heathrow in many ways. 
I think he's better run. I think the management team are more commercial. Uh, I think the uh, the customer uh, base is uh, one that uh, we would want to serve. Um, the challenge we face at the moment is we, we've had to do what is right in the environment that exists. But uh, you know, I'd like to think that uh, British Airways will be uh, operating at Gatwick in the future. Thank you. And uh, Gavin Newlands has a similar related question. Yeah, thanks so much, Chair. Um, the Glasgow and Edinburgh airports have twice the number of flights uh, to London City Airport um, as Gatwick. So I'm just asking, is there a future for BA or BA City Flyer as it is um, at City um, following the end of this uh, coronavirus period? I, I think, again, that's something we'll have to see through this consultation. The one thing I would point out is that uh, London City Airport is the airport that was of the greatest challenge as the... Uh, the evidence of the downturn, the downturn became apparent. It was the first airport that I'm aware of that, that physically closed. Uh, it was the airport that uh, you know saw all of the traffic uh, removed from the airport uh, ahead of pretty much every other airport in Europe. Uh, so I think it um, you know, clearly points to the specific customer segment that supports London City Airport, uh, and uh, I think that airport is one that will be. Uh, challenge greatly as we go through this and indeed uh, as we come out of this. Uh, but our future there will be something that we will uh, consider in consultation with the elected representatives of uh, the uh, BA City Fire Operation. Okay, thanks, Chair. And so now, uh, Mr. Walsh, uh, we move to um, the subject of passenger refunds. And I'm going to ask my colleagues Simon Jupp and Carl McCartney to take us through this, starting with Simon. You're on mute, Simon. Simon, sorry, just to, if you want to stop there, we can't hear you. We'll just check our end. Simon's on mute. We can't unmute you, Simon. Can you try again? Okay, we can't hear. Carl, can I ask you to, to take? Can you hear me now? Yes, Simon, we can hear you. Apologies for that. My technology failed me. Um, good morning, Mr. Walsh, and, and thank you much for appearing in front of the committee this morning. Um, I, I'm getting many frustrated emails from East Devon constituents who are asking why British Airways, the nation's flag carrier, is failing to repay them and other customers for cancelled flights. Can you answer that? Um, I can assure you that where customers are entitled to a refund, they will get it. We apologise for any delay that customers have experienced. Uh, I think you would appreciate yourself that this is an unprecedented level of cancellations and refunds that we have to do. But uh, we are committed to giving uh, customers the refund that they are due. And we appreciate the patience that has been uh, demonstrated by most, if not all of our customers as they go through this process. How many of your customers are currently awaiting refunds? I don't have a specific figure. I can tell you that since um, February, since March, since the beginning of March, uh, IAG has refunded uh, over 1.1 billion in refunds. Will you commit, having not known that figure, and that's understandable in the, in the circumstances, to replying to the committee with a letter setting out how many re refunds have been given out up until today? The, the, the one thing I would say is that it changes every day. That's a, that's a yes, yes or no question, really, not really one you can answer with anything further than yes or no. Well, well, well you know, I will answer it a little bit more because I just want you to understand that uh, the situation changes because in many cases it will depend on the number of customers who have applied for the refund. Uh, but, uh, we, so taking, we into, know so taking people, into account we the do amount of refunds people, they've requested up people, until today... So taking into account the amount of refunds as requested up until today, will you reply to the committee with a letter of how many have been given out so far? I mean, that's a simple yes or no question. And I appreciate times change. I appreciate that customer levels of refunds will uh, go up and down throughout this crisis. But up until today, will you uh, promise to send us those details? I would certainly look at doing that, yes. Thank you. Um, how long on average is it taking to refund passengers and do you know how much money is waiting to be paid back at the moment? As I've said to you, I can't give you specifics. Uh, we are attempting to refund people as quickly as possible. Uh, we have given the commitment that all customers who are entitled to a refund will get a refund. Okay. Now, 
in terms of the refund process, obviously these uh, applying for refund with anything is is uh, is relatively painful, but it shouldn't be. We've been told that you've removed the online refund section of your website and customers need to ring you to receive a refund. Why have you done this when the online refund system has worked in the past? Because the online system was not set up to deal with the volumes of activity that we're currently experiencing. And is the new system coping with the volume of correspondence you're currently receiving? It, it is coping as best it can, given that uh, most of these, if not all of these, have to be manually processed at one level or another to ensure that the uh, refund is correct. Do, do you admit that this is a, a more frustrating process for people who would be on the phone for a long time? I realise your call centre opens at, at 6am, but it's a long time for people to wait on the phone. It's very frustrating. Is this perhaps designed to put people off from going through the process at present? Most definitely not. You reportedly have fewer staff in your call centres to deal with these inquiries. We realise that social distancing and other measures put forward for workplaces do make this quite a tricky situation. Do you recognise the unnecessary stress this could cause to people whose custom you should value even more at this time, given you want them to be future customers? Yeah, we certainly do value our customers and we appreciate the patience that they have shown, but you're quite right. Uh, you know, as a result of uh, social distancing, we've not been able to operate the call centres in the same way. But we do have significant numbers of people working from home. Uh, we have to ensure that the security arrangements in place to do that are, uh, are, are proper to deal with the sensitive information that these people are dealing with. Can you tell us how many of your staff who usually work in the call centre are currently working in terms of numbers, so we can have an idea of what the impact has been of social distancing? No, I don't have that figure. Um, are you planning to review the refund system you've put in place to ensure it's serving its purpose? Because, I, you know, my inbox is, has been quite busy uh, over the last couple of weeks, people frustrated with the refund system that you've put in place, and to be fair, other airlines as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned other airlines because I don't think the challenges are unique. Just in fact, I suspect that we're operating in a much more uh, convenient manner than many airlines. I've seen airlines talk about taking at least six months to refund people. Um, the scale of this is different to anything we've ex uh, experienced. But yes, you know, we, we do review it all the time. And if we can improve on the situation, make it uh, easier for people and make it more convenient, we certainly will. Is there perhaps a, a cause to actually up the number of people who are able to answer the phone? Because once again, I'm saying to you that many people are waiting a very, very long time to get through to your staff. And we've, we've gone through the process of, of why that might be, and we understand why, but perhaps it's time to, to up your game a little bit and, and include more staff in that process. If, if it can be done, we will do it. Uh, you know, the, the thing I'm sure you've got to understand is anybody dealing with these processes need to be trained. How we do that training in current environment is, is very different to how we would have done it in the past and it's clearly much more difficult as a result of having to uh, do social distancing. But you know, we're, we're trying to get as many people as we possibly can. I think that's evidenced by the fact that not all of our employees have uh, been um, furloughed in the job retention scheme. In fact, I'm not aware of anybody in the call centre that has, and, and we've been supplementing people in the call centre with experienced people from other parts of the business to ensure that we can have as many as, as many people as possible who are capable of doing this work. You're also offering vouchers to customers via website. Given the publicity about financial difficulties, why should people trust your voucher scheme? Uh, this is an option that we make available to people. Uh, should they wish to cancel their flight in advance, uh, because uh, they can wait if they like until the flight might be cancelled. Clearly, if the flight isn't cancelled and they're unable to travel, uh, then they're not under law entitled to a refund. So we're, we're offering people as much flexibility as possibly can. And, you know, if you haven't already understood the determination that we have to ensure that we work our way through this and ensure that uh, we survive not just this immediate crisis, but survive in the long term as well, then... Uh, I'm, I'm disappointed that I haven't managed to land that message because I would have thought that became very clear to everybody who's listening. Um, in that case, just going back to the vouchers for a second, how many vouchers have been issued so far? I, I don't have that figure. Uh, 
Okay. Do you commit? So you earlier on you committed to letting us know how many of your customers are waiting free refunds as of today. Do you also commit in your response to the Transport Select Committee to let us know how many vouchers have been issued so far? Because once again, I'm getting complaints from constituents. I'm sure other members are as well, uh, saying this process is quite long and convoluted, and therefore we'd like to assess the success of this particular way of working. Uh, I'll certainly have a look at that, and I would, however, make a point that. Uh, for you to assess the success, you would need to assess it relative to everybody else, um, because you know clearly that would give you an indication as to how successful Bridge Airways is. I suspect we've been more successful, uh, more customer focused than many of our competitors, simply because many of our competitors will not have uh, the financial resources to enable them to uh, exercise the refunds in the way that we have. Uh, but I've no doubt that that's something that the committee will be looking to do with other airlines operating in the UK. We look forward to your letter and are, I sincerely hope you're right in that, in that case uh, for my inbox and many other MPs as well. I'm now going to hand over to Carl McCartney. Uh, Carl, you're on mute. Uh, German, can, can I ask you, uh, this was yes. scheduled to last for 90 minutes. Uh, yes, can you give us another 10 minutes, Mr. Walsh? Would that be okay? Uh, it, it, no more than that, I'm afraid, Chairman, because I do have other commitments, and uh, as you said, we we're scheduled to finish at 11:30. My my apologies. I, I it should have said 90 going to 120, but let's uh, let's take no more than 10 minutes of your your valuable time. Uh, Carl, are you back with us now? Uh, so we're struggling with uh, with Carl. Uh, we'll come back to Carl. Um, can I ask uh, that we now move on to? Uh, the health implications for protecting passengers and staff. I'll have one member perhaps cover this. Uh, Graham Morris, was this you or Chris Loden? Graham. Hi, Chair. I wanted to ask um, uh, Mr. Walsh, can, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, clearly the, the, the challenge that we face is to uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19 and given that we've had over 30,000 fatalities and over 200, 200 NHS staff have, have sadly uh, succumbed to the virus, we're, we're not in any doubt about how important it is to, uh, to prevent the spread. But specifically in terms of what British Airways can do, I, I've always thought it was perverse that we didn't have more rigorous checks uh, at ports and airports if we are serious about preventing the spread. But specifically, Mr. Walsh, uh, what steps could you put in place both to protect staff you know, with PPE and in terms of you know, providing the appropriate standards of deep cleaning the aircraft and so on that, that would help to uh, mitigate against the spread of COVID-19? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Uh, the one thing I would say is that there's very little evidence uh, of any um, passenger to passenger uh, contact um, spreading of the coronavirus. That's not to say that people on flights have not got off the flight and then subsequently tested positive and spread it as a result of that. Um, what we can say is that uh, we will take all measures and we are working with regulators to implement what I hope will be a common system uh, across, let's start with Europe, but a common system across Europe and hopefully uh, globally that will dictate the measures that need to be taken at airports on board the aircraft and to ensure that all of the uh, responsible authorities are able to uh, track and trace everybody who has uh, come off an aircraft uh, to ensure that uh, you know if if there is anybody that tests positive that they can that they can be uh, tracked um, so we are working with uh, a number of regulators i believe that EAS, uh, the european safety agency will be publishing a draft document sometime this week, which will set up the regulations that they will propose by uh, to the EU27. Uh, I expect that to be a comprehensive document which will deal with all aspects of that. We will follow um, an input, uh, certainly, but we will follow any regulation that is introduced to ensure that people can be confident that it is safe to fly on board an aircraft in this environment. Thanks, Mr. Walsh. As and when flying recommences, are you taking steps to um, implement appropriate procedures for staff 
and also to uh, acquire supplies of PPE for staff to, to ensure they're protected. Uh, and uh, again, you know, to, to ensure that the maximum standards of safety apply. Yes, that, that will all be done. Uh, as, um, as soon as it's clear of what uh, elements of measures need to be taken, uh, but I do support the mandating of wearing face masks. Um, clearly, at a time like this, we don't want to do anything that would divert supplies from critical health and care uh, areas. Uh, so whether that's a, you know, a form of face mask or some form of face covering, but uh, you know, I, I support that and I believe it should be mandated. Uh, uh, I think that would be a positive development. And uh, measures do need to be taken at airports and I support the uh, temperature monitoring of uh, customers coming in uh, to the airport and also uh, customers arriving off the, uh, the aircraft. So I think these are all sensible measures that can be put in place as well as then specific uh, PPE for people uh, in certain areas of activity, uh, the provision of the facilities to enable them to ensure that they can wash themselves uh, and comply with all of the recommendations that the health specialists uh, would be making. Thank you. I'll hand back to the chair. I know time is very short. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Uh, Carl, can we try you again and see if it works? Your mic's on mute. You're now unmuted. No, it's still not working, Carl. I'm really, really sorry. Very, very frustrating. Um, Mr. Walsh, I'll just briefly come back in and we'll see if we can get Carl for a third time. Um, you have delayed your, well, come back from retirement in the sense you've delayed it by six months. Um, can we ask you what your own terms and conditions will be for, for those six months? We heard from John Holland Kay, the chief executive of uh, Heathrow Airport, and he's not taking any pay for the following three months. What is your own financial situation in terms of your comp? Yeah, I, I think I was probably one of the first CEOs to uh, volunteer to take a pay cut. So my uh, base salary has been reduced by 20%, which will be the case. Uh, for as long as I continue in uh, the position that I'm in. And, and in the event that there is success in the future, will any of that be re reloaded back in? No, no, I will not be paid for anything. Uh, you know, as if this is uh, paid that is for gone, I'm not getting it back. Okay. Um, well, I think I'll try Carl one last time. Third time lucky, we hope. Carl, you're on mute, so that definitely won't work. No, it's still not working. Um, Carl, I'm, I'm ever so sorry about that. Um, Mr. Walsh, can I just say thank you very much for being so candid with the information, the answers. Uh, you always are when you come before the committee. And on behalf of us all, can I wish you uh, and your team and all of the staff well in getting through this and uh, every success for the future. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Chairman. I appreciate that. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.